Okay. If you feel too hot, I'll open it, but... I don't feel too hot. I'm not the speaker, so hi, everyone. I'm Kate Baker Demers. Again, I'm the Executive Director of Children's Scholarship Fund in New Hampshire and your resident education freedom fighter. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today, uh, I'm going to introduce you now to um, Commissioner Frank Edelblu, who I think um, we are one of the only states in the nation for whom our Commissioner of Education um, is a homeschooler. And so that's a really fun piece of New Hampshire information. Um, Frank was also a state representative before um, and during his term in the House, he served on the Finance Committee and the Children and Family Law Committee. Um, his kids um, were homeschooled. Some did go to schools. Um, he also has done a lot of innovative things in New Hampshire, um, created programs like the Learn Everywhere program that people are modeling and looking at to copy nationwide. And so that's been really exciting. Um, it's always interesting to talk to him because he really gets beaten up here. And that always means that you're doing a really good job. So when someone attacks you and says you should resign or stop doing what you're doing and over and over and over again, then you know you're really doing a good job. And, and the commissioner really here in New Hampshire does get beat up a lot. And so just take a minute and say thank you to him for that. Thank you, commissioner, for doing that and taking the heat. Right, exactly. Yes, taking the heat on education. You know, he's instrumental in working on and getting our education freedom account. It's passed in New Hampshire. Um, and I, I think that's about it I could give for an intro. So again, we're really lucky in New Hampshire to have him. Um, his topic today is called Gaslighting America, and so that'll be really fun. But again, an incredible um, advocate for children in New Hampshire, incredible advocate for parents and education freedom, um, Commissioner Frank Edelblu. Thank you, Kate. I am going to... Um, stay pretty close to my written comments. I'm happy to take questions later. And I do that because it helps me to stay out of trouble. Um, as I pointed out, so I, I do have seven children. We home educated all of our kids. Um, they're all doing well, thriving. Um, but in terms of getting in trouble, so this morning before I came here, I had about 150 emails calling for my resignation. Um, I won't be resigning in case they're interested, but I just... <laughs> When you know you're over the target. And I was like, I didn't even do anything bad. Like, at least let me get away with something if you're going to call for my resignation. But today we're going to talk a little bit about gaslighting America. And so Wiki, uh, obviously the preeminent scholarly resource, defines gaslighting as a colloquialism, loosely defined as making someone question their own reality. That ever happened to you? Um, the term may also be used to describe a person who presents a false narrative to another group or person which leads them to doubt their perceptions and become misled, disoriented, or distressed. So while the definition may not fit precisely, gaslighting describes how America's parents feel about interactions between the American education establishment and the American people. And I will use that term, American education establishment, often to mean, in general terms, how did, what did Corey, how did he describe it? Yeah. Government schools, yes, okay, we can, those are, are uh, synonymous there. So whether it is academic achievement, funding for public education, or the controversial diversity and equity, hold on to your seats, folks, uh, parents are waking up to what is going on. So let me give you a little bit of history. You know, so because efforts to change the education system have been ongoing for a very, very long time. And this is really at the national level as well as at the local level. And so let me share some of this history with you. So in 1964, going way back now, right? In 1964, the Equality of Education Opportunity Committee, or the Coleman Report, as it is often referred to, questioned why the black-white achievement gap persisted 10 years after the landmark education lawsuit of Brown v. Board of Education that tried to level the playing field. In 1965, President Johnson initiated his war on poverty with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which provided for the very first time significant federal funding, had never happened before, significant federal funding into education with the premise that more funding would improve education and that improved education would eliminate poverty. Almost 60 years later, how's that going? In 1983, a nation at risk report by President Reagan's administration summarized the education situation as follows. 
If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre education performance that exists today, we might have viewed it as an act of war. In 1989, the story continues, President George H.W. Bush gave us the National Education Summit. They might have been running out of titles at this point, I don't know. The National Education Summit, which established education goals to be achieved by the year 2000, including that all U.S. students would achieve competency in challenging subjects like math and English and science. Not to be outdone, in 2001, George W. Bush gave us the No Child Left Behind Act, an effort which required rigorous academic standards that must be attained by 2014. And, not to be outdone, in 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act by President Obama included the aspiration that all students, this is a quote, all students in America be taught to high academic standards that will prepare them to succeed in college and careers. Is anyone else seeing a pattern here at this point in time? So in spite of these Herculean efforts, and that's a hard word to say if anybody ever wants to try that, Herculean efforts, the system has been incredibly resistant to change, really any change. The school experience that you had as a child is basically the same school experience that students have today. In spite of the fact that we all know it has not been meeting our expectations, the expectation of parents, or even the expectations of educators that run the system. And yet any attempt to change the system are met with shrill cries, that was a deliberate word there, shrill cries from the regular cast of characters. And Corey leaned in on some of these. They roll out the same tired old arguments that the changes will ruin public education, as Corey described, and they will cost taxpayers millions. Setting aside the fact that these tired, old, and oft-repeated arguments never come true, it is simply anti-student not to try and solve this decades-old problem. So the lack of progress has not gone unnoticed. It's probably noticed well in a room like this, but some non-conservative voices in this include the New York Times, who on December 5th, 2019, included a headline that stated, it just isn't working. The PISA test scores cast doubt on US education efforts. I didn't make that up, that's the New York Times. The Washington Post reported, that some 23 million American adults are functionally illiterate by the simplest tests of everyday reading, writing, and comprehension. And about 13% of all 17-year-olds in the United States can be considered functionally illiterate. Functional illiteracy among our minority youth may run as high as 40%. In a separate article, the Washington Post says, can we fix the schools? Maybe not. So the statistics, this is a quote, the statistics are alarming. A quarter to a half of 12th graders enrolled in America's public schools test below the, even the basic level for reading, math, and science skills. This is a quote from Rick Hanischek at Stanford University. A recent headline that some of you may have seen out of Baltimore highlighted the fact that in a high school down there, 77% of the students at one high school are reading at an elementary school grade level with more than 30% of high school students reading at the second grade level or below. These are students that have been in the system over 10 years. Here in New Hampshire, now bear in mind, we are a top performing state, right? It's a relative system. But if you look at, you know, across the country and you see like, well, different rankings, New Hampshire is regularly one of the top five, top three relative to what's going on. When you look at the statistics in Baltimore, is it, that's not really saying much, right? But here in the New Hampshire, where we are a top performing states, we provide an assessment to students. It has a, you know, a, a, a cut score. So we rank those students from one, the lowest, to four, the highest. 42,000 students in New Hampshire, a top performing state, are at the lowest level of proficiency in English language arts. If I look at math or I look at science, it's even lower. 42,000 students, right? It's easy when you start talking about averages, we're at top performing states. Those are 42,000 students here in our state of New Hampshire. So these performance statistics mask 
an underlying but very important trend that's taking place, right? It's easy to look at averages and say like, oh, everything's going okay, the average is improving. But really what's happening is that if you dig down underneath the layer of those results, our top performing students or my top quartile students are pretty much holding their own or they're showing some slight improvement. And yet my lowest quartile students, my bottom performing students, are showing decline in performance. So they're falling farther behind. Now that's a statistic for New Hampshire, but it's a statistic across America, right? This is not unique to New Hampshire. This is the system that we have created. And so essentially, this system that was created with an aspiration of becoming the great equalizer has in fact become or is becoming the great divider as we see that equity gap, that performance gap widen. And so when confronted with the persistence of this problem, the education establishment just howls. Anybody want to know what their next howl is about? Money. If only we had more money. But this is yet another gaslighting. While lamenting what they assert are decades-long lack of adequate funding, the same establishment ignores the reality that funding increases have quadrupled over the decades even after adjusting for inflation. It ignores that the lack of consistent relationship between more spending and better test scores has been documented time and time again, both in actual practice and across hundreds, not a few, hundreds of scientific studies based on empirical data. As a result, what happens is that the increases become an exercise in spending more money on the things that did not work in the first place. Anybody ever hear of that happening before? Now, I'm disappointed that he's not here, but I'm going to call out Ian, Jody's husband, you know, because our own Ian Underwood has done a lot of great analysis on school funding. And one chart of his that I particularly like is a district level cost per pupil comparison at the time of Claremont compared to more recent per pupil costs. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Claremont, it is the seminal school funding lawsuit here in New Hampshire that, among other things, resulted in increased state spending on education. And the results of Ian's analysis shows that after you adjust for inflation, that every district is spending more now than even the risk richest districts were spending, other than one, back when the Claremont case was settled. And so, or first adjudicated, right? So think about that. The poorest districts in the 1990s, when Claremont was first litigated, are spending more money than the wealthiest districts were spending at that time, and yet the results have not changed. Right? So put yourself back to 1990. Well, the reason why some districts are performing poorly is because they don't have enough money. And if only we got them some more money, then they would be able to perform well. Well, now we've given them more money than the richest districts had then, and the performance has not changed. There's a systemic problem at foot here. So recognizing perhaps that parents and taxpayers are growing wise to the sleight of hand that is taking place, the education establishment has recently introduced a new straw man to distract us. It turns out that the reason that schools have not been successful in reaching their goal is because of the systemic racism that is pervasive throughout. Of course, like no one should tolerate racism of any form. And let me repeat that. No one should tolerate racism of any form. But it is understandable that so many parents are skeptical of this latest trope. And quite frankly, the logic model is difficult to wrap your head around. You know, without assuming or taking any responsibility, the education establishment, government school, asserts that the system that they built, the system that they have controlled, and the, fist, the system that they have fiercely resisted changing for at least the last five decades is systemically racist. <laughs> but fear not, they will fix it. They simply need more funding. <laughs> Question this latest setup, and it certainly must be the result of your own racist tendencies. America's parents are not buying it anymore. They have become the powerful American consumer that they have always been 
and they will not settle for a substandard product any longer, as Corey even described it. The election in Virginia sent shockwaves through the system as parents flex their new enlightenment and that system may not have that the system may not have the best interests of the children in mind and that the system the government school may be more interested in protecting their monopoly status. There was an election in San Francisco weeks ago. Not a conservative bastion and it sent a strong message that educating children is what the parents want. That's what parents want, right? We're just trying to send our kids to school so they get educated. Tone deaf to the result, all the system could muster in response was that the rejection must be due to the racist tendencies of the voters. I had written down 18, but Corey corrected me now, it's 19, but 19 states have introduced legislation to fund students instead of systems. I think he said somewhere over 30 are working on legislation as well. And essentially, these are systems, these are, are policies that make parents consumers, not bystanders, in the education of their children. These efforts are succeeding in many states, including here in New Hampshire, and putting us on the right side of history. As one would expect, teachers' unions are the primary opponent to any choice efforts. What is interesting is I went back and I looked at the NEA resolution uh, opposing school choice in the 2021 uh, annual meeting of the NEA. And predictably, this is, I could have guessed this, right? Predictably, it invokes some of these old, tired, and false arguments, and then it sub supplements the race argument and even adds a religious discrimination argument. From the resolutions from the NEA, Resolution A24, the National Education Association believes that voucher plans, tuition tax credits, or other funding financial arrangements that use tax money to subsidize, I'm going to just substitute this in, students instead of systems, you know, it doesn't say that, um, students instead of systems can, what's the first argument? Undermine public education. It's going to ruin public education. Number two, reduce support needed to adequately fund education. Never would have seen that one coming, huh? That one snuck up on me. How about this, number three? Cause racial, economic, and social segregation of students. They're adding the new argument, and then they add a new one, and threaten the constitutional separation of church and state. That has been the cornerstone of American democracy. The association opposes voucher plans, tax credits, or other such findings. Probably I didn't need to read that last sentence to you because you had already figured that out before you walked into this room. But pursuit of choice options for the live free and learn state is easy because of its consistency with what we believe about children. Namely, we believe that children are inherently curious. We believe that learning is not limited to 7.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. in some specific building someplace. As evidence to this premise, this logic model that I'm asserting here, um, you know, uh, and the veracity of these assumptions, consider our little ones. I wish they were still here. They were doing great during Corey's speech. Weren't they contributing to the whole time? You know, I mean, these are little, these littles, and if you, I said this sentence earlier in the, in the, the uh, question and answer panel discussion. Thank you, Jody, for filling in that word for me. Um, but basically, before these kids have ever walked through the doorway of a school, before they've ever met a teacher, they have, for the most part, mastered an entire oral language. That's no, like, uh, simple undertaking. And if you don't believe that three-year-olds are inherently curious, take a three-year-old home, put them in the kitchen, close the door, and come back in an hour and see if they're waiting for someone to give them a worksheet. Probably not going to happen, right? We know this. Inherently, this is who, the, who people are, right? Okay, how about this one? How about dropping three 16-year-olds off on a street corner in downtown Manchester and telling them you'll pick them up in four hours? Do you imagine that they will wait around for someone to give them instructions about what they should do? Of course not. Everybody knows that's silly, right? They will immediately start to explore their environment around them and figure out what's going on, learning what's happening around them. So the belief that children are curious and learning all the time is what helps drive some of New Hampshire's programming relative to education. It's been mentioned here once already, but I'm going to lay into a couple of these. Thank you for mentioning Learn Everywhere. Learn Everywhere is a program that I love. I just think it's a beautiful thing because it basically plays to the strengths of children and that natural curiosity. 
So the way that Learn Every so Learn Everywhere is a program where children are able to get credit for activities that happen not in school on their own time. And the way that that program really came about is one evening as the commissioner, I was visiting Memorial High School here in Manchester. It was uh, about 8.30 at night. Why I was there so late, I'm not really sure. I can't remember. Other than there was a first robotics team that was there. And so I walked into the school, and there was about 25 students there. And I had a bunch of students that were coding in Java, getting their robot to navigate through some obstacle course stuff. I went into the back room, and I had some students. They literally had hacksaws out, and they were working on their robot with two Bosch engineers to build their actual robot. And you just, these kids were engaged, they're having fun, they're just enjoying themselves. On the way out, probably about 9.30 at this point in time, and I'm leaving my visit at Memorial High School, and there's a young lady who's the captain of the team, and she comes up to me and says, Commissioner, Commissioner, you have to help us. I'm like, what's wrong? She goes, the school closes at 10. We need it open till 11. And my first thought was, ding, I got kids begging me to keep the schools open at night, right? Like, when does that happen? But then the second thought that I had is, these poor kids are going to go home at 10 o'clock at night. They're going to go home at 11 o'clock at night. And then they have to do two hours of homework because all of this learning that they've been doing, learning how to code, learning how to engineer, learning how to cooperate with one another, learning how to, there's a business aspect of FIRST Robotics. That doesn't count, right? Only the learning that happens between 7.30 and 2.30, so they got to get their work done so they can bring it back the next day. And so that was really the genesis of Learn Everywhere. So now in New Hampshire, Students are able to get credit for learning wherever it happens, whether that's FIRST Robotics, whether that's Kumon Math, whether that's the New Hampshire Institutes of Science, whether that's the Boys and Girls Club, whether that's Neil Stone's Karate Academy or the North Main Music Center in Nashua, just to name a few of these programs. Many of you probably have programs as well. In fact, I know Lee is sitting over there. He has a program. He could teach kids all kinds of stuff about trees and biology and all kinds of stuff. That's learning that sticks deep with those students. And so when we do this, it actually helps the schools in a, in a very significant way. So we have another program that's going to come before the State Board of Education shortly. It's a, an eSports program. And I'm not going to reveal too many things about it because we're still pushing it through. But this eSports program um, is, in a, is in a town here in New Hampshire. And I got a call from the assistant superintendent in the district in that town not too long ago. They have a course in the high school. It's a computer science course. It is the most failed class in the district. Most failed class in the district. Not because it's hard, because it sucks. It is the most, <laughs> this is what I was told. I never take the, I've never taken the course, I can't say. But because it is so unengaging, right? They just, they, there's no creativity to it. There's nothing that engages the students. And so we're working with that district and an esports company. Is everybody familiar with esports? You guys all know what that means. Okay. No? Okay, so esports is basically uh, gaming, right? So in the esports program, these kids build gaming computers. They know what a fast graphics card does and why they need one in their computer, right? So they learn how to build computers, they learn how to program gaming, um, and they learn how to engage those games as well. And so through that esports program, New Hampshire students are going to be, instead of taking the most failed class in the state or in that district, they will be able to learn computer programming through something that completely engages them. And so that's an example of how it helps the schools. So now it's just another tool in the toolbox for those uh, schools to be able to pull out and use to help their students make progress. It helps educators as well. I can't tell you how often I hear from educators, and what they tell me is that they got into teaching, they got into education because they really wanted to open up worlds to children. They wanted to nurture that natural curiosity that students have and help them to, to explore and grow. But what they find is they get into the system and the system is very rigid, it's not flexible, it's hard for them to, to teach and they just feel like they're like, all I gotta do is I just gotta follow the rules all the time, I got this you know, progression that I have to keep on and if I don't you know, get enough widgets done in the day, I'm gonna be in trouble or something like that. And so Learn Everywhere is an opportunity for the gig economy for teachers. Because the teacher, like say you're a physics teacher and you're teaching physics from 7.30 to 2.30 in this quote unquote oppressive system and you're like, oh, this is really tough. Well, how about from three o'clock till the late bus, 
you decide to teach physics on your terms through a Learn Everywhere program, right? Where you take that passion that you have for opening up worlds to children and make it alive for them. So that's an example of how choice is in New Hampshire. I'm gonna do two more. Another one is we have something in New Hampshire that is, it's a relatively emergent type of a program, but in New Hampshire, we believe in what's referred to as a competency-based system. And what I mean by that is that we don't really care where you learn or how you learn, we just care that you learn, right? And so a competency a system is we have a, a rule in New Hampshire that says, a student shall receive acknowledgement of achievement of the competencies contained within a course, this is kind of regulatory language, I apologize for that, um, and shall be awarded course credit and shall be eligible to take another course when the following is met. The student demonstrates knowledge or skills on an assessment approved by the local school district for a particular course, right? So districts can have an assessment or the student demonstrates knowledge and skills on an assessment approved by the department if the school doesn't have one. So if your school, like basically it's just saying, can you clep out of a, of a, um, you know, of a class? And I'll just give you an example of that. And, and why it's so hard for us to do that and defend the system so much, I'm not really sure what it is. But I have one of my own children who went from one higher education institution to another higher education institution. And you know, whenever you do that, you do two years at one college and two years at another, it's almost impossible to get through in four years, right? So I'm like gonna be stuck with a whole nother year of tuition. And so I'm like, what are we gonna do about this, Jonathan? So what is, it? he goes, his, his, the, second, the, the institution he went to afterward was Berkeley. So not a schlep school. In Berkeley, in his first semester, he clepped out of 18 college credits. He sat down, he passed the final exams on all those things, because he knew the material. The kid was already knew what he was doing, and he got 18 credits. If Berkeley can give kids 18 college credits because they demonstrate that they know the material, why in the world can't a high school in New Hampshire, right? And so we have that rule in place, and that's something that we need to continue to develop. And then, of course, the piece de resistance, right, uh, of this philosophy of letting parents and caregivers, those who know the children best, um, and with few exceptions, have the best interest of the child in mind, make decisions about how to deploy hard-earned taxpayer dollars to educate children, education freedom accounts. And so, you know, yes. <laughs> And just, you know, really what you should be doing is thank a legislator in New Hampshire, right? There's 400 of these guys who are overcompensated at 100 bucks. Is that right? You know, right? Oh, minus taxes, right? And they have to pay for their license plate if they want one of those fancy license plates, right? You know? Um, so, again, just thank a legislator because these guys are doing yeoman's work to try and help move these opportunities forward for New Hampshire children. Okay, so we're calling everybody who's either a former or present legislator has to stand up in the meeting. I wonder if this cuts into my uh, Q&A time. Okay, so states where these efforts to create opportunities for children, where they fail, they are not on the right side of history and not on the side, really, of families and children. Those opposing these efforts need only look back to history to see that. And we've seen a couple of states just recently. Idaho went down, Georgia went down. Corey would be able to tell us all the other ones that have struggled. Oklahoma, I think, had some trouble as well. You know, parents have a fundamental right to make decisions for their children. And that might seem like an obvious statement in a forum like this, but not everyone, especially the government schools or the education establishment agrees with that philosophy. And this is why, for our part, we must remain engaged in this noble fight for the next generation of children so that they might live free and learn. Thank you for letting me join you today. And I can, I'm happy to do questions. <laughs> I'm only taking one question, no. <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here today. Um, I was a public school teacher for 33 years, New York and here. Thank and you. You're welcome. And one of the things that I saw that was very distressing was the social promotions that were going on in the elementary schools and middle schools. The kids get to ninth grade and they're held account accountable and a lot of them just didn't understand what to do. Um, I'm, I retired in 2019, so I'm not sure if you've changed that, but I saw that as one of the biggest stumbling blocks for high school kids because they didn't know what to do. They were never told that they were responsible for their 
work, they would just get pushed along. So I do want to comment on that, and that sounds like it's a failure from the very beginning of the system, but let me describe to you kind of what the state is on the ground. Um, so imagine, I, I, I alluded to it before, but we have what we refer to as statewide assessments, right? So students have to take an assessment in 11th grade. Uh, we use the SAT here in New Hampshire. Um, so you assume that the, the assessment, and this, we have a New Hampshire SAS earlier on, so it's our educators who give us the assessment, right? The educators have said to us, SAT is a good assessment to understand what the students are learning. The educators have said to us that, um, you know, we will take care of the instruction, so we'll instruct the students. The educators have said, we'll set the cut score, meaning like what's a passing score or not a passing score. The content of that assessment are our New Hampshire standards, our academic standards, which the educators have said to us, here's what we think kids need to know in order to be successful in school. So they tell us what the kids need to know, they teach the kids, they design the test, they score the test, we get less than half of them proficient, and we graduate 90% of those kids. That's sad. That's just not right for those kids. So this is, but this is the system that we have in New Hampshire. This is the system that we have outside of New Hampshire. Remember, we're a top performing state, right? There's a lot of other states that are willing to pass these kids out even sooner and with less preparation than we are. So it hasn't changed. All right, well, it is a big difference than when I was in public school then, because we did have to. Hold them accountable. Yeah. Yes, less of that. Uh, hi, Frank, Dennis Pratt. Um, so when you set a measure and you you and and that's the goal uh, that drives the whole system uh, and you talked about this that, that that the measure now is equity um, I think I, I I'm I'm curious because I'm not equal in all things you know there are things that I do really well there are things that I do really poorly um, and I think that you know our kids are so different and I just do not understand this idea that they have to have an equal outcome and that that is the measure of success or failure. I think that every, every child should be expanded in the areas that, they, they, that they, they will blossom in. And if they're not good in this area or that area, that's okay. I, I just do not understand this thing that we've accepted their measure. So I would tell you, I don't know that we've accepted it yet. This is the latest straw man that's come in and it's pernicious, right? Um, this idea of, you know, equity of opportunity uh, as opposed to equity of an outcome, right? And so they're arguing for equity of outcome. Everybody needs to achieve the same thing as opposed to have that opportunity. Um, but really, that is, that's in its infancy. I mean, we hear a lot about it, but I don't think it's into the accountability systems at this point in time. So there is still opportunity to say, like, to call time out and say, like, no, we're not buying that, right? It's not going to be where we're going to go. Um, because we do have to recognize the individuality of students. We have to let students to be able to um, you know, reach their best potential. That's what we're after. We're trying to open up worlds to these kids. And we have a system that's holding back students. And I guess, let me just weigh in on one other equity thing, and maybe this is where you're going, or maybe I don't understand your question. I mean, you do have disparity, right? So, you know, my, when I talk about my performance, my top performing students tend to be from socioeconomically advantaged homes. My bottom performers tend to be from disadvantaged homes. But that's not universal, right? That's an average. Like, I've got, you know, poverty students who perform really well. I've got wealthy kids who perform really poorly, right? So we have to focus on individuals and how do we get individuals to success? And I think that's what you're saying there. But I would say that, you know, the, the, um, the equity is, is a prevalent conversation in today's dialogue, but it has not completely permeated the system at this point in time. There may be, a, there may be attempts, yes. Uh, Commissioner, you're someone who definitely likes to look over the horizon, not just to say what the snapshot is now, but where are we going? And we've implemented EFAs, I think, successfully, incredibly successfully, not without a few more gray hairs on your head, perhaps. Um, <laughs> learn everywhere. My question for you is, what is the tipping point for education choice? What, what is the point at which um, the fundamental underlying thesis, the, 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 the theory of the case of traditional public schools changes? And when do you think that happens? <laughs> That's an awesome question, um, and it was interesting in the panel discussion this morning, Corey is, was talking about how, you know, we've seen what's referred to as kind of a, 
you know, in the system, they call it a large shift, like 3% of students have kind of opted out. And I'm like, 3% doesn't impress me, right? Like, how about 30% of the kids deciding to make a different addition? Like, it has to be substantive, or it's just going to claw back, it's going to vaporize. I mean, here in New Hampshire, just by simple demographics, we lose one to one and a half percent of kids every year anyways, because they just, nobody had the kids. I, ha I did my share, but not everybody <laughs> has contributed to that pool, right? So, um, so I, I don't know, Greg, I think that's a great question, but I do not know the answer to what that tipping point will be. Um, but I would say that, you know, just off, off the cuff, that tipping point is when every family has and, and knows that they have options for their child's education. And that comes about when we flip the script on what are the premises that we believe about education, right? I mean, right now, and I said this earlier today, but we, we talk about, you know, what do we believe about education? Well, everybody believes that in order to learn, you have to have a teacher. Well, maybe that's not true right? Everybody le believes that in order to learn, you have to be in school. Well, maybe that's not true, right? And if, if you begin to substitute out some of the things that we believe about education with a different set of premises, it will drive you to a different place. But I think the tipping point we're looking for is that every parent who has responsibility, whether they want it or not, to direct the, uh, the education of their child recognizes the responsibility and recognizes that they have options to, to help make that happen. Well, so my, I have three things. I'll be quick on the Jody's first two. Jody's got three things. Anybody surprised, huh? <laughs> so, so first is, is a bit of, um, uh, so you, you said that New Hampshire is, you know, the, one of the top states, but we, we, like, we like to use, Ian and I, a different term. We say least worst. <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to stay out of trouble today. <laughs> so you can say whatever you want, Jody. Fair. <laughs> the second one, all right, so this is getting more to the point. Well, actually, first I want to thank you so much for being here. I really love hearing you um, speak anytime. Um, but so question, clarification, you, you mentioned this, this rule about being able to test out. Uh, is this new? So no, I put it in place probably about six or nine months ago. We just haven't had time at Relatively the agency new. to develop it at this point in time, but it's there. It's on the books. It just has to go. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, I, I just hadn't heard so it before. Can I tell you, so we have approved one assessment for Klepping Out, which is uh, working with Sal Khan, because Sal has a, um, you know, an assessment, a, a proctored assessment platform to be able to do it. Uh, the second assessment that I have in my sites is something referred to as Praxis, um, so Praxis is the assessment that the teachers have to pass in order to get certified. And so I feel like that would be a difficult one to argue against. If you need to pass this test to be the teacher and a kid passes it, it would seem like giving them credit might be helpful, right? That'd be awesome. So you got to pick the low-hanging fruit as right. much as you can. And so then my, my question on top of all this, and it, it actually adds on to what Greg was saying, was like, how? I mean, there needs to be some kind of social media campaign to help parents know that they have choices for their kids, that they can test out, that they can go to learn everywhere, they, that they can do all these things. What is the department going to do for that? So, well, I mean, so I appreciate you saying that. So just to be clear, like, I'm going to stay out of uh, federal prison because I can't use federal money for many of those activities. So, because there's a limited, you know, like these are taxpayers dollars, so we don't get to do that. But I will, so we will do what we can to get the, mo the messages out. When we release these programs, I will talk on MUR, I will talk to reporters, I'll try and push it out. But really, in state, there are organizations in the state, you know, AFP in particular, case organization, who have put money into social media campaigns and mailings and phone banking and stuff like that. And so really it's a function of groups like this pushing that message out so that nobody um, is left behind. Everybody is able to get it. And, and by informing you, um, there was recently a uh, survey done in the state uh, around with parents of young children. And um, in the survey, they said, like, well, where do you get information about raising your kid, right? And 77% of the time, the place that people go to get information is friends and family, right? So the more we can just spread the word, that's where they're going to go find it. The next place they go is, you know, Google it. And then about 3% of the time, they go to the quote-unquote experts. All right. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Um, hey. So mine kind of dovetails and I feel like maybe I didn't really understand what you had said earlier about the the competency based um, test outs uh, from my perspective I'm, I'm actually in a competency based grad program and it's, it's a good model 
Um, but my concern kind of is the anticipated way for that to uh, carry over into like transferability because you go instead from a you know traditional A through F ranking with a GPA and things like that to a essentially pass fail and that's a lot harder to like you know rack and stack um, for for candidates for like higher learning and things like that is that a relevant question or did I misunderstand how this competency is going to be implemented yeah, so it is a real question, um, but I would tell you it is less and less relevant in terms of question, because I get it often from parents, right, because we've got Learn Everywhere programs. We have some schools that use scales of one to four. And so you're saying, like, well, if I don't have the traditional A, B, C, D, F, how, what's my transfer going to look like? How am I, how's my kid possibly going to get into school? So first of all, the schools, I was told by a Harvard, um, you know, admissions counselor that, and uh, I'll try and get this right, that they, Harvard has received applications from students who have been raised by wolves and were signed with a footprint or, or a paw print, right? Because they're kind of, they got kids coming from all over the world, right? So they figure out who they want and how they want to get them in there. So I wouldn't say that the, sec the post-secondary system has no problem processing these variations. And quite frankly, we need to disrupt that system that oftentimes is you know, is built around a model of gaming the system to make sure you have more of the A's on there than the B's and the C's and the D's, right? Um, I, I sometimes say, and, and many of you probably who are not in education might even agree with this, like on the business side of the world, we, uh, I like to say the A kids work for the B kids and the C kids companies, right? So um, it's just, you know, who is going to be that new entrepreneur or something like that? So, so the post-secondary question is a real question, so your question is a good one, um, but it is uh, not a real problem. Thanks for coming here, Frank. Um, my name's Patrick, I live in Manchester. And uh, so I was in high school 25 years ago, but I'm a free seer, so I was in uh, San Diego. I wouldn't have guessed more than 26 years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I grew up in San Diego, and my experience in high school was that when you start looking at uh, careers or what you do after high school, um, everyone's promoting, and they would have these career fairs, and they promote one of two possible paths. You go into big academia, or you go into the military. And those are pretty much the only groups that were invited to these career, career fields at the high schools I went to. Um, looking back at it, it seems entirely predatory and something that the education establishment is in cahoots on. And I'm curious what your stance on and that is, or is there anything your department can do to prevent these predatory organizations like Big Academia and Military Industrial Complex from coming into our schools and trying to trick our young people into doing these things? Great. Thank you for that. And uh, we do have a specific program here in New Hampshire that I want to flag for you, but you, there's actually a third group that you miss, which is I would call my career and technical schools, which is, you know, kids want to go into vocational training, right? I don't know about you, but I could sure use a good plumber and electrician right now, and they're making bank these days. So that's not a bad pathway for somebody if they wanted to pursue it, and we have those. So we have a program in New Hampshire that was recently launched. It's called Work as Learning. I'm using Biden Bucks to fund this thing. And essentially what it is, is we're working with employers in New Hampshire uh, to provide students with work opportunities. And we will match the wages, you know, up to 15 bucks an hour, up to a certain number of dollars, like there's a certain limitation on it in terms of what they do, so that we can get students out into the real world. So they get to see what does work look like? What do I think I might want to do with my life? You know, you figure out a lot of things that way. Here's what I like, here's what I don't like. What are my opportunities? Um, and we have already, in, so that program is in the Career Pathways program for students that every student in high school has access to, every student in high school is required to complete, where they, they take an assessment and it gives them some direction, like, hey, you might be a good architect, hey, you might be a good plumber, you might be whatever. We've mapped all of our education programming. And Dean is the one who actually did all this, right? Uh, we've mapped all of our education programming from our high school, our secondary programs, our CTE programs, our post-secondary programs, our you know, career school programs. And then we now have in there the actual businesses. So if a kid's in there, say he takes the assessment, says, hey, I'd be a good programmer, he can look and see how many internship opportunities do I have with plumbers? Can I go out and work with the plumbers see if I actually like this or not like this? So just trying to create another opportunity there. Lady Tom Williams, where New Hampshire? So I want to testify. Where? Yeah. where? North where? Nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a question. I went to this judicial committee in the Senate with another Vietnamese immigrant to testify against 
the um, Teachers Union Democrats bill to repeal our state law do not teach you know, divisive concept in our schools, whatever you call it, CRT, you know, and DEI. And then we were outnumbered, two aging short women against 20 teacher union supporters. And they also use students. That sounds like a fair fight. Yeah. I know you. <laughs> I wish I knew some Kung Fu, but but they say is so, if you study Rules of Radical, that book, we're supposed to be factory community organizing. We cannot just play, you know, defense. We have to play offense. They're suing you now, the commissioner, to go to the trial, you know, right? To go to the injury I mean, the date. That to say, hey, you gotta repeal this don't because we're so afraid of teaching history now and we cannot teach you racism anymore. So we got to come out with some kind of, you know, uh, and the counter strike effectively. I've been saying for years, our people have been passive and nice for years. That's why we lose this country. You know, that's why we have to fight back. <laughs> Sorry, I put you in the spot. Yep. No problem. And uh, so Rachel's been fighting back pretty hard, haven't she? Yes, yeah. exactly. Moms for Liberty. So I guess the only point I'll point out is, so we have a law here. We don't want discrimination in our state, right? And I wrote an op-ed, it's a public op-ed. You know, we should be teaching our kids about racism, but not to be racists, right? And that's a difference that we wanna make sure that we distinguish. And beyond that, I really can't comment because it's, I don't have one, but I have two lawsuits on this particular sure. topic, so I can't comment on it any further. All right, Rachel, you and I have to talk then. <laughs> we'll take a fight to somewhere. <laughs> yeah, leave him or not, he got too much to handle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I, mean, I just want to say for the record, I've lived in five countries and four states, and this is the least racist state I have ever lived in. My life. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Frank, taking back on that, um, that was a great answer because I, I'm in the trades and, you know, life takes a path to get Trying you to different places. For you. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and so one of the things that I found, because I, you know, a whole school, homeschooler, I have a lot of homeschooling friends. One of the big issues, if you're running a legitimate business, uh, you know, legal business like I am, uh, is the U.S. Department of Labor, which stops children from working, uh, stopped me from working as a kid. I tried to work early. People are like, I can't hire an 11-year-old. That's illegal. Um, and then I recently wanted to hire someone and uh, went to the New Hampshire Department of Labor website, and then there's no regulation about this. That's great. They're like, but check out the U.S. Department of Labor website. And it says, absolutely no. That, that kid you mentioned that wants to be a plumber, he can't do that until he's 16. Yeah. He cannot work in a construction trade until he's 16. So uh, I guess my question would be, where do you stand on secession to get rid of the U.S. Department of Labor? <laughs> so, so I'm going to answer that question with a, uh, and what you should do is like reach out to our office. We'll help you get a DOL certification so that you can offer kids opportunities. But we do have to live within that federal regulation. So. I guess mine's kind we're, of a And then we're, at, we're kind of at last two minutes. Okay. I guess mine's kind of a follow-up on that. Is there any age limit for kids taking these exams that you have, and can they, at 10 or 12, graduate from high school by taking all of those? And then how do we get them jobs? Well, so if they're going to graduate at 10 or 12, I'm going to tell you they've got to be some pretty smart kids. So I don't know, you know, like looking out at the crowd, there's probably about 50-50 out there. I don't know. Um, so uh, these programs, again, because we're not, like Learn Everywhere is not a program that's linked to a school year, right? It doesn't start in September and end in June. It just runs, right? And so we don't really care when you get those competencies you know, how old you are when you get those companies. So if you're in, you know, in eighth grade and you master them, then you get to bring that credit certificate forward to you to secondary so you can use it there. So we're trying not to create this divide and, and stay in the rigidity of the system in all of these choice programs. And so thank you very much for letting me come and join you this afternoon. I really appreciated it. It's been great to meet many of you. So thank you.